The title of my talk today is What's Wrong with Austerity in the Context of the Ongoing Economic Crisis? Five years ago, the world was entering into the most serious economic crisis since the Great Depression of the 1930s. Since the depths of the crisis, economic conditions have improved to a limited extent in the United States, though unemployment and underemployment remain high and millions of people have stopped looking for a job. Moreover, much of Europe remains mired in a deep recession. Yet the policy remedy for depressions and deep recessions is well known. It was first theorized and expounded by John Maynard Keynes in the 1930s, and it was successfully applied in subsequent decades by governments in most advanced capitalist economies to avoid anything like a repeat of the Great Depression. In brief, what is called for to avoid or to recover from a deep recession is for the government to increase its own demand for goods and services so as to replace the lack of demand from private sources that prevents the economy from operating at full capacity. Reducing taxes to encourage individuals and private businesses to step up their demand is another helpful step that the government can take. Such measures constitute a fiscal policy of stimulus. Once it became clear that the world economy was plunging into what's been called the Great Recession in late 2008, one would have expected governments in North America and in Europe to apply such a fiscal policy to expedite recovery. With its 2009 stimulus program, the Obama administration did so, albeit on a modest scale, in the United States. And that, no doubt, prevented the economic crisis from turning into another Great Depression. But for the last three years, U.S. fiscal policy has been the opposite of stimulatory. Government spending has been curbed and public sector employment has been cut back, declining more than ever before, except at the federal level right after World War II. And at the beginning of this year, taxes were raised. All of this represents a policy of austerity. Meanwhile, in Europe, the dominant fiscal policy since the onset of the economic crisis has been one of austerity. Why, you may ask, have most governments in the West rejected the Keynesian remedy and instead engaged in a policy of austerity that has clearly inhibited recovery from the ongoing economic crisis. The case for austerity rests on worry about the growth of government deficits and the national debt. When the government spends more than it receives in taxes, it runs a budget deficit and must borrow money from the private sector to finance the excess of expenditures over receipts. In the midst of a recession, Government receipts go down and government expenditures go up, so it's likely that the government will be running a deficit. To the extent that it wants to pursue an expansionary fiscal policy to combat the recession, it will run a higher deficit and need to borrow more, as did the Obama administration in 2009. And such budget deficits add a corresponding amount to the national debt. Many prominent economists and many politicians have expressed much more concern about rising deficits and rising national debt over the past five years than about continuing unemployment, underemployment, and workers leaving the labor force. The economists most prominently associated with concern about rising national debt are Carmen Reinhardt and Kenneth Rogoff of Harvard University, whose widely referenced research about the correlation of lower rates of economic growth with higher ratios of debt to GDP i.e. gross domestic product, led them to proclaim that an economy would get into real trouble if that ratio exceeded 90 percent. The same worry about rising national debt has been expressed over and over again in the United States by countless politicians, not only the great majority of Republicans, but also a significant fraction of Democrats. And this view has been pushed by a number of prominent think tanks and bipartisan commissions such as the Simpson-Bowles National Commission on Fiscal Responsibility uh, in 2010. Public discourse about economic policy in the United States has been dominated by such deficit hawks, as they've come to be called, who've pointed to continuing government budget deficits and rising national debt since the onset of the economic crisis to force U.S. fiscal policy to turn from stimulus to austerity. And in Europe, the deficit hawks have ensured that the fiscal policy response to the ongoing crisis remains one of austerity. Now let's look more closely at what has actually happened to government budget deficits and the national debt in the U.S. economy over the long term. 
since the relevance of all such uh, economy-wide indicators depends on their relationship to the size of the economy, it's appropriate to measure them as a percentage of U.S. GDP. Consider first the ratio of U.S. government deficits and surpluses to GDP. As you can see from the first graph, in most years there have been deficits, hence increases in U.S. national debt. Uh, these deficits were especially large during World War I and World War II, and the U.S. economy recorded surpluses only for periods of time in the 1920s, the 1950s, and the late 1990s. The second graph provides further detail. In almost all years since 1980, there have been U.S. federal government deficits. Only in the late 1990s, President Clinton's second term, were there actually surpluses. Note how the deficit GDP ratio shot up in 2009 at the onset of the Great Recession. Government budget deficits, deficits were indeed higher under Obama from 2009 to 2012, mainly because of the economic crisis, which automatically reduced federal government revenues and raised federal government spending. But the Obama stimulus legislation, designed to boost economic growth, cut taxes and raised federal government expenditures in 2009 and 2010, helping to limit the depth of the crisis. See how the deficit GDP ratio has actually been declining since 2009, and it's expected to level off over the next decade near the long-term average. Now let's look at what's been happening to the U.S. national debt over the years. Keep in mind that the U.S. national debt at any given time is the sum of all past annual federal government budget deficits, i.e. excesses of government spending over revenues, minus any budget surpluses which reduce national debt. In this graph, the red line shows the growth of the national debt in money terms, and the blue line shows the ratio of that debt to GDP. What is at issue is the most relevant measure of national debt, i.e. the debt owed to lenders outside the federal government itself, because that is the debt whose repayment would be borne by U.S. taxpayers. And that is what's shown in this graph. The debt-GDP ratio spiked high during World War II, then declined fairly steadily until 1980. And then, as you can see, it began to rise again as the government ran budget deficits in all years except the late 1990s. The debt-GDP increases were greatest under Presidents Reagan and George W. Bush, in both cases due to big tax cuts, whose main beneficiaries were the rich, and big increases in military spending. Budget surpluses resulted in significantly declining national debt only in the late Clinton years, thanks to strong economic growth in the late 1990s. In short, Republican presidents allowed national debt to rise, and then they demanded that Democrats do something about it. Now, what's really so bad about a rising national debt? Let's consider the main arguments made by deficit hawks who warn against government deficits and resulting increases in national debt. First, uh, deficit hawks argue that just as it's bad for families to keep spending beyond their means, so the U.S. federal government shouldn't keep running budget deficits, because in each case, rising debt will lead to ruin. But there's a fundamental difference between the debt implications of spending by individuals or families and the debt implications of spending by a national government. When a family spends beyond its means on food, clothing, shelter, entertainment, or whatever, then such extra spending will generally have no effect on its future income, so the family will struggle to repay the debts that it owes. But when a national government runs a budget deficit in the context of an economy in recession, the extra spending that it stimulates will result in increases in output and employment across the economy, which in turn will result in increased tax revenues that ease the burden of repaying government debt. Furthermore, neither in the case of individuals or households, nor in the case of private businesses, nor in the case of governments, does it make any sense to rule out borrowing altogether. Borrowing makes perfect sense if it's used for investment that increases future output and income, out of which the debt incurred by the borrower can be managed or, if necessary, paid in full.
Just as a private business will borrow heavily to finance investments that are likely to yield a real rate of return greater than the real cost of borrowing, so individuals, households, and governments should borrow the, for the purposes of investments that are likely to result in future streams of income that are greater than the streams of payments that must be made to service the corresponding debt. Next, noting that the U.S. national debt at the end of 2012 was over $16 trillion, more than $50,000 per citizen, deficit hawks argue that because we'll have to pay off that debt, each of us is really $50,000 poorer than we think. However, no country ever pays off all of its national debt because carrying the debt can cause a problem only if the burden on taxpayers to service that debt becomes too onerous. The debt service burden in the US or in any other country in any given year is equal to first the size of that part of the national debt held by lenders outside of the government relative to the size of the US economy multiplied by the average interest rate paid by the US government on outstanding debt. Consider, for example, the year 2012. Both US GDP and US national debt were roughly 16 trillion. But only 11 trillion dollars was owed to outsiders, so the ratio of relevant debt to GDP was about 70 percent, as was shown in the previous graph. At the average interest rate of a little over 2% in 2012, U.S. debt service payments came to roughly a quarter trillion dollars. Sounds like a lot, but it was just 1.5% of U.S. GDP. This is a lighter debt service burden than in almost any of the last 30 years, when the burden averaged about 2.5% of GDP. And it constitutes just under 6% of total U.S. federal government spending, the lowest figure since the end of World War II. Even though the interest rate paid by the US government on outstanding debt has risen in 2013, it remains well below 3%, very low by historical standards. So the cost of servicing the debt is pretty small compared to most every other relevant indicator in the economy. Now some deficit hawks claim that high levels of national debt will lead to runaway inflation and result in high interest rates. But in the US, the inflation rate has stayed well below the Federal Reserve target of 2% over the last four or five years. And the real interest rate, the interest rate minus the rate of inflation, which is what matters to borrowers, has been zero or negative over the past four years. This is in spite of continual claims by deficit hawks that both rates would soon shoot up. As long as the U.S. economy remains in recession with employment and output well short of their potential levels, there is no reason to expect prices and interest rates to rise much at all. Only when the economy recovers to the point that shortages begin to develop in labor and product markets will strong upward pressures on prices and interest rates begin to develop. As and when that does begin to happen, we will be thankful that unemployment has come down significantly and that GDP has gone up significantly. The higher level of GDP will itself help to reduce the debt service burden because it depends on the relationship between debt service payments to GDP. Uh, as John Maynard Keynes has said, uh, the time to worry about debts and debt service payments is when the economy is functioning at a high level, not when the economy is in recession. What about the Reinhardt Rogoff research? which implies that economies like the United States will confront serious problems if and when the debt-GDP ratio rises above 90 percent. That research, so often quoted by politicians and by right-wing ideologues, was shown earlier this year to have con contained a key spreadsheet error and, more seriously, uh, to have highly questionable treatment of the data. Moreover, it's at least as likely that lower economic growth would correlate with a higher debt-GDP ratio because the former leads to the latter rather than the other way around. And in any case, it's not at all clear that the effects of an austerity policy in reducing the growth of national debt will outweigh the effects of austerity in slowing the growth of GDP, as numerous European countries have learned to their distress over the past five years.
Now even the IMF, which had been giving strong support to deficit hawks, has begun arguing that the push for austerity policies went too far and that the US and Western European countries should pursue more of a stimulus policy to promote economic growth and to reduce debt pro problems in the long run. The truth is that deficit spending adding to the US national debt is especially desirable now. When the US economy is in recession, priority should be given to reducing unemployment and raising the rate of utilization of productive capacity, which will raise GDP and thereby also help to reduce the burden of debt service payments. What is preventing this from happening now is not the growing national debt, but a lack of overall demand for the goods and services the economy is capable of producing. The federal government is uniquely well placed to provide needed demand stimulus, which it can do precisely by spending more than it taxes. For example, by distributing funds to state and local governments and public institutions so they don't have to keep shrinking their activities and laying off workers. As the federal government did indeed do for in 2009 and 2010, uh, thanks to the Obama stimulus bill. All of this means running a larger federal budget deficit in the short run, but it makes it easier to manage the national debt in the long run. For future generations of Americans, there are much bigger threats than higher national debt. For one thing, the threat posed by global warming, with consequent sea level rises and ever greater intensity of storms and droughts, which will significantly reduce economic growth and impair the quality of life. For another, the threat of underfunded public infrastructure. All kinds of educational facilities from preschools to research universities, as well as roads, bridges, airports, waterways, and communications are currently being starved of funds. Thanks to the cutbacks uh, associated with the austerity policy imposed on the US economy by a Congress that refuses to consider Keynesian economic stimulus. Bequeathing a higher national debt is far less of a problem for our children and grandchildren than bequeathing a world whose climate has been compromised by global warming and a country whose infrastructure has deteriorated for lack of public investment. To conclude, I'd like to address a question that is probably on your mind. How is it that austerity policies have displaced Keynesian policies as a response to the ongoing economic crisis? As I've indicated, Keynesian policies designed in times of recession to stimulate the overall demand for goods and services served the wealthy capitalist economies of the world very well in recovery from the Great Depression and in maintaining relatively high rates of employment and capacity utilization in the first quarter century following World War II. But these policies began to be increasingly questioned and Keynesian analysis criticized during the 1970s when high rates of inflation and a slowdown in the rate of economic growth plagued the major capitalist economies of the world. Within the economics profession, the difficulty of reconciling Keynesian macroeconomic analysis with the foundations of the prevailing analysis of market-based economies led many, especially in the United States, to drift away from or abandon altogether Keynesian economics. Following the 1970s, much of the economics profession believed that the kinds of problems addressed best by Keynesian economics were unlikely to recur, as they believed that capitalist economies had become immune to depressions and that recessions could best be handled without Keynesian policies of fiscal stimulus. An important element in this evolution of economic thought was the growing rightward trend of political discourse and governmental policies in much of the capitalist world. Politicians, as well as economists, became increasingly convinced of the virtues of markets and increasingly skeptical of the ability of government uh, to improve upon market outcomes. No matter that these outcomes were becoming increasingly unequal and unstable. This perspective has been called neoliberalism, and it has had enormous influence on economic policy over the last three or four decades. Keynesianism, which assigns a significant role to government in ameliorating economic conditions, has been shunted to the side. 
For right-wing parties, politicians, and ideologues in the capitalist world, neoliberalism has provided welcome support for policies such as austerity that have the effect of starving the beast of government at the national, state, and local levels. Starving the beast may be good news for the well-off elite whose taxes and whose responsibilities are thereby reduced, but it's bad news for the economy and for the rest of us since government provides indispensable services and is sorely needed to combat periodic economic downturns. Thank you very much.